today we are off to the Isle of Man to see the best watchmaker in the world. This trip's been in the planning for about four months now, so it's really exciting that it's finally happening. This video's gonna have to be in multiple parts because it's gonna be long. Uh, so make sure you hit subscribe and that bell icon so you don't miss out. If you wanna support the channel, pop over to barkandjack.com and sort yourself out with a nice NATO strap. And uh, let's get into it. Welcome Jack, I'm Adrian and today we are at Roger Smith's workshop on the Isle of Man. If you're not familiar with Roger Smith, he makes watches in a very different way to pretty much everyone else. And today we're going to find out how. My approach to watchmaking, well we call it the Daniels method. And that was an approach which George started, I think by, I mean with no real intention in the 1960s when he had ideas for the advancement of the mechanical timekeeper. He obviously knew how to design watches but he ended up having to make them himself because there was no industry around to support him. So quite by chance he created this un unusual approach where one man will design and make a complete watch from start to finish and he'll make you know to all intents and purposes every single component within the watch and this was an, uh, an idea that uh, just grabbed me you know from my very first meeting with George as a 17, 18 year old, I can't remember when. This idea that one man can sit down and do that. And that's what really sparked it off for me. And that's what we're doing today. What are you striving for with your watches? Is it reliability? Is it um, to make the most complex watch? Is it to make uh, the most beautiful watch? What is it? it I, think, I think it's everything. I mean, I think I was brought up in this you know, very unusual approach to watchmaking where you focus on absolutely every single aspect of a watch. So whether that's the case, the dial, the hands, every single screw, spring, lever, throughout the whole watch, you are 100% focused on that tiny, tiny component. You know, it's, it's a complete package as far as I can see. And I think it is just this attention to detail and you know, when I'm designing a watch, as I say, I'm not just designing a nice looking watch. It has to be a very mechanically efficient watch. And I think that's the sort of driving force of what I'm trying to do, really. I've done a lot of work with the coaxial escapement and uh, we're seeing extraordinary results with that. And you mentioned coaxial escapement there. Yes. Yeah. Could you explain in a very simple term what, how that's different to a normal escapement? So the lever escapement is, I mean, the big problem with it is that you have, um, you have a tooth which um, hits the jewel and is locked there. And then the jewel moves out, the tooth slides, then begins to slide down this inclined face. And as it slides down this inclined face, it imparts energy through to the balance wheel, through a right. lever, through to the balance wheel to maintain its oscillation. This sliding action requires lubrication. As the oil deteriorates, it becomes harder for the tooth to slide down that jewel, and then it slows the watch. And eventually, you know, it may stop the watch because it just gums up. So your watch will go back for a service because this oil has deteriorated mm -hmm. and it'll need refreshing, removing and refreshing. In the coaxial escapement, the power is delivered by simply a tooth hitting a jewel and just pushing it away. So right. it's uh, just very much a pushing action. There's minimal sliding there as the tooth slides off the jewel, but because it's in the direction of travel, it's negligible. It's due to this pushing action that we um, don't really, the escapement doesn't rely on lubrication. And um, it's that which is a great advantage to the coaxial. And so you have a longer degree of accuracy um, before the watch will ever need a service. And um, it's so that in, in theory, your watch will maintain a high degree of timekeeping for a far longer period than that of the lever escapement. So you've got one of your specific specifications is single wheel version of the Daniels coaxial escapement. Yeah. So you've taken, I assume, what um, George, da George Daniels created. Yes. And 
simplified it by a single wheel? Yeah, so so basically, so in the very first watches that I started making, the wristwatches, uh, with, which contain the coaxial, this was back in 2006, I fitted those with the um, sort of three-tier sort of system, which is basically a standard pinion, then you have a lower wheel and an upper wheel, and that comprised the whole escape wheel. And um, the problem that we were having, I mean, I wasn't aware of this in the early days, but it was basically, it's very difficult to, to make sure that the teeth of your lower wheel were 100% concentric with the teeth of your upper wheel. Right. Because by the time you've made the two wheels and then mounted on the arbor, things move, you know. And the coaxial is very accuracy sensitive, has to be bang on. And I was noticing that, you know, in practice as well, you know, each watch was slightly different because of this. And we were able to, t it was taking different rates of time to achieve a good rate of timekeeping. You know, there's no consistency. So I was looking at ways of smoothing that out. And then I came upon the idea of creating the single wheel. So basically we machine the whole wheel in one operation. So that means that we can guarantee that the concentricity of the lower teeth are the same as the upper teeth. But not only that, we can now guarantee that the, we can fix the angular orientation of the two sets of teeth perfectly to each other. And again, that was a difficulty in the early versions. Right. We had to twist the upper wheel round and that caused difficulties in maintaining the concentricity and angular orientation. So creating that wheel propelled the escapement forward hugely in terms of our ability to achieve a high rate of timekeeping far quicker than we were doing. The actual rate improved, but also more noticeably was the mainspring strength started to drop. Right. And that was a real sort of wake up sort of point really, because up until that point, to me, um, escapements had always been about timekeeping. That's been the bragging rights of any watchmaker throughout history is my escapement will keep better time than yours. <laughs> But actually, for the first time, I began to look at the schemas completely differently. And I now, you know, then began to realize that actually, I mean, our escapement will keep as good a time as any other escapement out there, probably better in the long term than all escapements out there. But here we had an escapement which was beginning to benefit the movement. It's now taking a weaker and weaker mainspring to achieve the same results. So that meant it was less force going through the pivots less force going through the winding mechanism. And suddenly I was beginning to realize that, you know, if we can carry on in this same direction, we can actually start to improve on the service intervals of the watches. And surely that's where watchmaking should be going. We've increased our service interval to 10 years, but that's based on the old movement. That's based on the Mark I movement with the larger diameter escape wheels. Once, you know, after this Mark II, smaller escape wheel, wheel has been out there, I can see our, us extending that 10 years, that 10 years service interval to maybe 15, maybe 20, wow. maybe further. I mean, it's, it, it really is astonishing. All of your watches are rated at um, 18,000 vibrations an hour. The design of my watches does go back to seeing early English pocket watches of two, three, 400 years, years ago. As mass production really took off in watchmaking, they realized was that um, if you can fit more ticks into a second, then it's far easier to attain a rate of timekeeping far quicker. Right. And it meant that you didn't need the highly skilled watchmakers to regulate the watch. You could cut down that sort of area of, you know, the whole process. But uh, the way I look at it is, uh, you know, from my approach to watchmaking is that the fewer ticks you can have per hour, the better. Right. Because it means the few times your wheels have rotated, your teeth have ticked, your balance has sloshed around in the oil in, the, <laughs> in, its, in its settings and so on. So to me, if you can have, you know, 36,000 train, 28,800, to me an 18,000 train is just a more mechanically efficient way of, of achieving the same thing. So you see, we have time to spend on regulating our watches and building our watches. So perhaps 
that's that's a reason there's another question uh, as as part of this section i asked him why his watches are all manual wind and why he doesn't use automatic movements his response was simply i think um probably because i don't know how to design an automatic yet the really interesting and kind of fun part of his method of watchmaking is he's not looking at what other people are doing he, he doesn't really know what's going on within the swiss watch industry he's he's not fussed about that he's focusing on what he's doing um and just just focusing on doing that to the best he absolutely can in the next video we're going to be looking at how he's designed and the challenges that he's come up with his series four watch the most complicated watch that he's created so far the great thing about his style of watchmaking is that he hasn't he doesn't go and buy in a, a movement maker he doesn't go and buy in someone who's created a certain uh function he just figures it out himself. I want my watch to do this. How are we going to do it? And it's quite amazing seeing his mind work. And he's very, very open about that process. He was an absolute gent. He was so welcoming to me. I organized to spend a couple of hours with him. And he just said he'd free up the whole day. Stay however long you want. I ended up staying until about half five at night. So a massive thank you to Roger Smith for allowing me to invade his workshop. His method of watchmaking really is special. If you look at guys in uh, Glashütte or in, or in Switzerland they will have different sections doing different things. And even people like Patek or Lange, they will have case makers, they will have dial makers. If they can't do it, they'll outsource this stuff. So the method of watchmaking that, that Roger Smith is, is carrying on and the, what George Daniels created really is so different. There are a few um, smaller people out there doing something similar, but to the level that Roger Smith is doing it, it, it is quite amazing. The journey is so long, it really is. Well, you'll see in the next video the detail and the amount of time that goes into creating these watches. In the next video, I also asked Roger about watch collecting and what he has in his collection. So guys, hit subscribe if you like this video and you want to check out other stuff. Do hit that bell icon so you know when the next video is going to drop. It's probably going to be around Friday. I'm hoping it's going to be next Friday, but it might be Friday or Saturday. These things, well, this video alone has taken me about a month to edit it was so complex it's the biggest project i've done so far with so much b-roll had multiple cameras going the audio was an absolute pain in the ass if you liked the video do hit that thumbs up button i absolutely loved making this video no i hated the editing but i loved the recording i loved the trip it was such such a great adventure the whole thing felt like a, a, a really compact masterclass in watchmaking and watch history so i've i've learned so much from roger smith just within the the, the, the six or so hours that i was with him thanks so much for hanging around and uh, check me on instagram at bark and jack if you want to support the channel jump over to bark and jack com and grab a NATO strap and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.